in our series examining the material health evaluation programs and introducing our new product, our material health overview. And we couldn't be more thrilled to have as our special guest today Stacy Glass from the Cradle to Cradle Product Innovation Institute. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you, Terry. So today on our webcast, um, we got a lot of great content to share with you and uh, for those of you who have attended uh, the first or second the HPDC or the DECLARE webcast, those webcast replays have been posted on our blog and after uh, Stacy's webcast and the webcast with uh, Clean Production Action and uh, Green Circle Certified next week, we'll post the next two. Um, and we'll plan to have a wrap-up webcast that pulls out the highlights, the learnings from each of these four webcasts and kind of gives a summary of uh, what's happening, what we've learned, and what folks who have participated learned uh, in this uh, current realm of material health uh, disclosure and evaluation programs. So we're going to start out today, for those of you who are visiting with us for the first time, give some background about Sustainable Minds and how we developed our Transparency Report program and now the latest Transparency Product and Material Health Overview. We're going to look at some of the research that we did to try to evaluate and understand how a manufacturer would choose which programs which program or programs are going to be right for their uh, design and disclosure uh, needs, and what does the uh, AEC professional learn from uh, any or all of these disclosures to help make a decision about products. And then Stacy will give us a deep dive on the cradle to cradle uh, product innovation certification process. We'll look at the product certification process as well as the uh, material health certificate, which is their new offering. And we'll look at how the cradle to cradle methodology can be used to drive understandable and uh, accessible uh, material health information uh, in a simplified, uh, understandable format. Over the course of the webcast, I don't think anyone is going to be new to being on a webcast. Um, please type in your questions. We will keep an eye on them and uh, we'll ask Stacy to um, reply uh, in context uh, or we'll get them at the end or if we don't catch your questions during the course of the webcast, we'll definitely follow up and um, get those questions answered. So today we are going to be talking about our new transparency product called the Material Health Overview. And what it does is it combines the manufacturer's product sustainability efforts into one integrated story uh, to inform safer and healthier purchase decisions. It's been designed for non-technical readers, so folks who are not uh, material health or material scientists or toxicologists. Um, it's also been designed for folks who are unfamiliar with product transparency reporting in general so that even if someone's new, you know, they can take a look at what it says and pretty quickly understand you know, what's in the product and why and a few other important attributes and, and learn more uh, because this page is, is in the cloud and links to all the references and underlying reports and we'll actually do a demo of it later. Um, and the bottom line is it's been designed to provide the value add of integrated explanation and improvement stories uh, that manufacturers can contextualize the disclosed data with uh, that isn't included in, in disclosures. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So by way of introduction, uh, Sustainable Minds is a software company. Uh, we are a cloud provider of applications, data, and services 
to help manufacturers large and small across the value chain design and market greener products. Our mission as a company is to operationalize environmental performance into mainstream product development and manufacturing in an understandable, empowering, and credible way for manufacturers to grow their businesses through greener product innovation. And our secret sauce, you know, what makes us differentiated in the marketplace from other software companies is that we use design and customer experience to make our products um, easy to use and understandable. People often say, I, I, you know, even with that explanation, I don't really understand where you fit into this landscape. And so uh, we made this little table to show um, that you know, we do have an LCA software tool that uh, was designed specifically for non-technical users, product development teams in early stage design to be able to benchmark, measure, model, and compare competing product concepts uh, to be able to make informed uh, trade-off decisions and make uh, greener products. When we introduce the Transparency Report program, uh, our Transparency Report is a Type 3 Environmental Declaration, our brand of EPD, and so we added program operators to our business model. So, you know, we're like these program operators in that we run uh, a PCR EPD program and we're a software company with, with an LCA tool. But the way that we scale and bring about change in the marketplace is by collaborating with all of the participants in the ecosystem, LCA providers, material health uh, assessment providers, so that ultimately they can deliver their uh, manufacturer's results in easy to use, understandable reports, partnering with verifiers and certifiers so that any uh, any of those folks in that industry can verify or certify um, the disclosures that get used in the, uh, the transparency products. So as I mentioned, our first product was this uh, eco-concept and LCA software tool. We simplified LCA. Uh, we were the first to bring a cloud-based tool for product development teams to the marketplace. Specifically, as I mentioned, you know, to use in early stage product development for non-experts to understand environmental performance, have real data to be able to make informed trade-offs against traditional data, and hopefully uh, make greener products. And in the last couple of years, now with uh, the intolerance of greenwashing in the marketplace, and certainly with the introduction of Lead version four introducing two aspects of product transparency, environmental performance and, and material health. You know, we understood that there was a lot of complexity you know, that needed to, to be broken down and interpreted. And it's all the same drivers you know, that are driving the demand for greener products, they're driving the demand for the ability to, to market them differently. One of the things we kind of took a look at was this word disclosure and um, you know it made us think if what the industry is asking for is disclosures as a manufacturer that probably wouldn't incentivize me uh, to want to provide this information practice because disclosure really doesn't have a, a very positive uh, spin to it um, and those manufacturers who are making the effort and spending the time to do these detailed analyses and opt to share the results should be rewarded. Uh, but they should have the opportunity to share those results in a way that really pays them back for investing uh, in producing those disclosures. So we believe that the value in a manufacturer investing in product transparency is to build a credibly greener brand. And the way that that credibility gets established is by demonstrating that the manufacturer actually does understand 
the results of those analyses and is using those results in product development to actually improve the performance and material health of its products. And so making greener decisions ultimately means providing information that's credible, understandable, and meaningful, which is ultimately what builds trust in a brand and trusted brands create value for their companies. So Sustainable Minds is in the business of helping product manufacturers make better decisions, better design, better marketing, and ultimately better purchase decisions. And so you know, we speak with many, many product manufacturers, and they ask us too. You know, we've spent a lot of money, we're looking at spending a lot of money, we really can't figure out the ROI you know, on, on this investment. Other than the fact that my biggest competitors are doing it, I kind of have to do it as well. Um, so you know, we, we ask you, manufacturers who are on the call today, you know, how will you leverage your investment in product transparency uh, into sales value? And you know, if you go down with the quick checklist, if you are producing you know, disclosures, you know, you know, people are banting about this, this phrase, checking the box, um, but that's great, but just the presence of an EPD or, or material health evaluation is not an indication that the product is greener or healthier or that there is any performance improvement. And as manufacturers who are investing in this create more and more uh, disclosures and reports, you increasingly have you know, more representatives, more partners, distributors, prospects, customers who want to know what it means and need those materials to do their job. They need to be trained, they need to understand what it means, they need to understand how to use it to make decisions. Um, so when we learned about lead version 4 a few years ago, I'm going to go into the backstory of how we developed the transparency report program a little bit. Uh, and it was uh, identified that manufacturers would need to provide environmental product declarations for you know, their customers to earn this particular product transparency credit. Um, I actually turned to our LTA technical expert, Ute Meyer, and, and said, you know, what's an EPD? I actually didn't know, I had no knowledge of, of what, what an EPD was. As my own background is um, long ago, I was a graphic designer. And so I had designed many product brochures many years ago. And so to me, an EPD looked like another product brochure. And so I wondered if a manufacturer is trying to sell products, and now if environmental performance is just part of the way they make products, combined now with all the decisions that they make about functional performance, cost, aesthetic, safety. These are all decisions made in the design process. These are all decisions now made in the specification and purchase process. So why wouldn't environmental performance information go in the same brochure they're using to provide all that regular information that people use to make a purchase decision? So we did a big uh, study with about 40 different EPDs from around the world different product categories, and the summary of our research was, was this, was uh, you couldn't really understand how a non-technical person would use an EPD to make a purchase decision. And our broader conclusions were that the way that the standards and the processes are executed today, there was no way that the current state was going to be able to be scaled uh, to fuel the transparency demand that was coming. And so uh, we created a, a list of these conclusions of what our new program is going to have to be able to do uh, to provide real advantages and real improvements. But you know, the bottom line really is everything that gets done, uh, creating the PCR, everything involved in doing the LCA, the inventory, the modeling, all of that is ultimately in service of delivering the report. And 
The report is how the information is delivered to whoever it is uh, that needs to use that information. And so we decided to first focus on the report and said, let's keep the science, nobody disputes that LCA isn't the right method for measuring the relative greenness of products and systems, let's keep that, let's just re-engineer the process and look real hard at the report. And so our transparency report, as I mentioned, is our brand of EPD, it is a type three environmental declaration. They can be called EPDs, they can be called anything they want, it says that on page one of ISO 14025. And you can create a transparency report from our uh, PCRs that are created in our program and now from any other existing PCR. And next month we'll be talking more about how to do that and we'll be showing some examples of that as well. So this was designed to leverage the investments of manufacturers making in LCA to create a credible and meaningful marketing tool to effectively present and build a greener brand. We also made a commitment that it would not be longer than three pages. Nobody has time to read a lot of pages, uh, and frankly, the content on most of the pages in today's EPDs are not really uh, interpretable or understandable by, by non-technical people. We said we're going to get it done in two pages, uh, and page three is optional. So this is a cloud-based report. Uh, it didn't make sense to encode data in PDFs anymore just because of how data gets used and how people make decisions and all the devices that we use and calculations that we need to be making. So let's get things out of PDFs. Page one provides the performance dashboard. So everything somebody would need to make a purchase decision, both functional performance and environmental performance. Page two is simplified LCA results and interpretation. And page three, is what the manufacturer is actually doing in any or all of the life cycle stages that are contributing to uh, improvements in the environmental performance. And they get to start telling that story here. You can tie these uh, statements back into uh, these LCA results. So we've worked really hard to make the LCA results both understandable and meaningful. So the way we look at it, this is our kind of big picture, is that designing and marketing greener products should be a continuous improvement loop and that a manufacturer can start wherever they are. They can start by designing better, benchmarking their products, understanding how to make improvements, and then go out to the marketplace and report, or they can start by reporting in response to that demand for transparency but then they should take those results from those reports and drive them back into product development. And in fact, LEED just introduced a new credit in July for demonstrating continuous improvement. So our products fit around this cycle of you know, design and marketing greener products. So when a manufacturer finishes an LCA and creates a transparency report, we provide that manufacturer their data back in Sustainable Minds software, so now their product development teams can take the interpretation from the LCA, the data and models in the software in an easy to use tool, and hopefully design a greener product or make a greener product, and they can go back into the marketplace and, and report it. So our transparency report program uh, provides three things, streamlined PCR process, an EPD, like to call it an EPD++, and software to help you design greener. And we've spent a couple of years building and evaluating and expanding that program. So last year, we turned our attention, we started turning our, turning our attention to the other side of product transparency that LEED has uh, instigated credits for and uh, effectively went through a very similar process. We said, okay, well, let's try to understand what the options are for manufacturers here. LEED has listed four, three or four different ways a manufacturer can earn this credit. And so when we uh, looked at this initially, 
these are the questions we came away with, and uh, you know, we figured if we came away with these same questions, so must many manufacturers and even uh, AEC professionals. Uh, so, you know, why are there so many different ways to disclose material health? Why do different AEC professionals ask for different things? You know, in our discussions with manufacturers, they say, you know, we're being asked for everything, and we have no idea what really to to provide. So we're going to do nothing until we can figure out the one thing or the two things that we need to do, which is that very question, well, how many disclosures uh, does a manufacturer need to do? And what questions does each of these different types of um, material evaluation programs answer? What does the manufacturer learn? Do any of them help with design? Or are they only all about disclosure? What do the results tell the customer? Um, and of course, you know, being very pragmatic, we said, well, you know, if a different kind of report is required, then just why not provide everything all in the same place, along with all the other stuff people need to make a purchase decision. So we did a similar uh, study. We looked at the different programs. We looked at the deliverables from the programs and came up with the same uh, bottom line question, how does a non-technical person use these to make a purchase decision, particularly when manufacturers who have gotten started have a mixture of, uh, you know, some might have cradle to cradle certified products and declare labels and HPDs. Uh, and so, how do their sales reps or even their prospects or customers make a determination um, about what do these various reports mean you know, when a product might have one or more of these, or different products have different versions of these? So, how do we, we use them? to differentiate. And so really the high level question to the manufacturer is uh, in terms of how do you make a decision about which program or programs is right for you, it starts out with what do you want to learn about your products and then what do you want to do with the results? These are the two starting point questions. And so the material health overview was designed uh, to leverage the manufacturer's investment in material evaluation, effectively build a greener brand, the very same thing as the transparency report. And what we determined was, again, people don't have a lot of time. What they really want is some key questions answered pretty quickly. You know, what's the product made of? Are there any hazardous ingredients? If yes, how bad are they? Are there exposure concerns? What are you doing to improve? And, and a few other things. Uh, but make it, make it simple. And so we looked at the different uh, programs identified in LEED and created a reporting tool that is standardized so that the manufacturer can use any of these programs as each meets that manufacturer's needs and report the results in a standardized, consistent format that quickly answers the questions that their customers want answered in a comparative uh, and standardized way. And I'll show you an actual demo of a couple of these. Um, but what you can see is uh, the format is standardized. What really is uh, uniquely tailored to each program is the visual representation of the assessment results. Um, what's key is the description of each program, the assessment results, and on the right side is the interpretation. What do these results mean? And what's the manufacturer doing to improve? So I'm going to pause on the explanation of the product for just a minute because we've gotten quite a bit of feedback in the past as we were working on this product and people saying, well, you know, why would you create a report of a report? So we just wanted to point out that that's already what people do when they create an EPD. So the deliverable of an LCA is a report. And in fact, an EPD is a report of the LCA report. And so you might ask the question, well, why are those EPDs still so long? And it's because they're still disclosures and treated as disclosures. So here we're making the analogy that 
an LCA is to a transparency report as a disclosure, any of the disclosures are to a material health overview. So these are disclosures, these are marketing tools. And to put a finer point on it, the transparency report is the type three environmental declaration. So the presence of this report is what earns the credit and lead. But in the material health overview, it's the background report. It's any one of these evaluation or assessment methods that earns the credit. We're just providing a standardized, easy to use uh, reporting uh, environment. So I'd like to, um, assure people that uh, this deck will be available after the webcast. There's a survey that comes up that asks you if you'd like to have it sent to you, which we're happy to do, and as I mentioned, it's being recorded. So what we did was, in this research phase now, we first looked at uh, the first credit option, because you can't get to options two and three without meeting credit option one, which is reporting. And we tried to break it down into kind of understandable components. Uh, there are programs that are identified already in the credit. Different organizations administer them. They have different reports. There are different standards. There are different um, screening, list screening uh, methods and lists. And Stacy's going to speak more specifically to this. And then there are programs that are in, in consideration. Uh, and there will certainly um, be more. As manufacturers think about what questions, what do they want to learn and what do they want to do with the results. So the, the top line distinction is that some are just purely disclosure programs and some are rating systems on top of that. They all follow the same steps. This is the uh, effectively the diagram that was produced from the harmonization working group. Stacy again is going to put more meat on the bones around this, uh, but as uh, non-material experts, we looked at this diagram and looked at each of the programs and said, great, they all follow the same steps, but they each offer a range of differences and affordances and, of course, different deliverables. And so what we did was we created a, um, a table of uh, attributes relevant to uh, that screening method and compared each of the programs uh, and how they get uh, implemented um, in content inventory, list screening, hazard assessment, et cetera, et cetera, and broke it down to evaluate each program. And then summarized it by determining there really are four top level criteria that a manufacturer has to prioritize for themselves to figure out which program or programs will fit their learning and reporting needs, public transparency, brand, third party verification, and price. And then finally, if all of these methods are useful for achieving credit option one, or will soon be useful for achieving credit option one. What do each of these programs offer in addition, in terms of uh, meeting the other two uh, disclosure programs, the other two credit options, I'm sorry, um, and other uh, value add? And finally, we looked at, well, what questions do each of these programs answer and tried to then tailor the design of the report uh, to answer each of those questions. So I'd like to turn things over to Stacy uh, and ask Stacy now to do the deeper dive on the cradle to cradle certification Thanks, process. And uh, Stacey, I'm going to ask you to kick it off while I troubleshoot the deck. Sounds great. Thanks, Terry. Uh, my name is Stacy Glass. I'm with the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. 
Our mission is to turn the making of things into a positive force for people and the planet. I joined the Institute four years ago, right about the time that it was founded. I had been working in a, um, uh, let's see, one moment, I'm just uh, accepting the presentation deck here. Okay, Terry, can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, thank you, Stacey. Okay, fantastic. Okay, my apologies. Um, I joined the Institute four years ago uh, after I had founded a green building supply company that I ran for a bunch of years. And what I was doing in that green building supply company, I was really passionate about beautiful products, about products that were well designed and that had you know, the most optimized sustainability profile. And I was working with a lot of small companies to bring these products to market through our distribution and marketing channels. Um, when I realized that you know, to, 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 to really have a truly optimized product, this has to happen in the design phase. And I was familiar with Cradle to Cradle. I had admired the book for a long time. And that kind of inspired me to take a six-month sabbatical, uh, go to the Institute, see if I could help them launch. And here we are four years later. Um, I'm, st I'm still around. So that's how I came to uh, kind of geek out on this material stuff uh, with the Institute. So what I'm going to do here in the next 20 minutes is give you a brief introduction to the full Cradle to Cradle program, but then I'm going to do a deep dive into our material health methodology. So you can really understand you know, what, what a manufacturer goes through during that process. And then I'll end with giving an overview of the material health certificate and uh, what, what that communicates um, to, uh, to your audiences. So first, let me start by saying that the Cradle to Cradle program is based on the seminal work of William McDonough and Michael Brongart in the 2002 book, Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things. The book presents a design framework, a really revolutionary approach to the redesign of industry based on the conviction that thoughtful design mirroring the safe, regenerative productivity of nature can create an industry that's sustaining and not just sustainable. So in short, the cradle to cradle design framework embraces the pursuit of maximum value and we think of that from an economical, ecological and social perspective through the practice of intelligent design. And this is the foundation of an emerging economy in which industry is designed to celebrate interdependence with other living systems, transforming the making and consumption of things into a regenerative force. And that, that emerging economy I'm referring to is the, the circular economy. You may have heard um, of those sort of emerging trends, especially in Europe. The authors began working with companies to apply these principles, and the framework for the Cradle to Cradle certification uh, program emerged. So the program is based on five principles. The first two, material health and material reutilization, are really about how it's designed. Material health looks at the ingredients, and that's what I'm going to dive deeper into today, and material reutilization means designing the product so that it either follows a biological technical nutrient cycle, it can return back to earth and be a valuable nutrient to earth um, and regenerate in that way, or it's a technical nutrient that retains value throughout its life cycle and can be reused, upcycled if you will, um, again and again in future lives. So those two attributes are really about how it's designed. The remaining three relate to how it's manufactured. That's renewable energy, water stewardship, and social fairness. And how we think of this all together is that we are designing products um, with clean ingredients that can be perpetually cycled, and they're manufactured in ways that respect humans and the environment. Okay? And this can be applied to any kind of product. Um, I happen to work with manufacturers in the built environment, but we have a big presence in fashion, consumer care products, uh, packaging, uh, the list goes on. So far, over 220 companies have engaged in the program. We have 384 active certificates, which represent over 2,900 products and product variations. But this brings me to a really important point in our program. We call this the path to positive. 
Cradle to Cradle is about continuous improvement. You can enter the program wherever you are. That might be at the basic level, the bronze level, uh, silver level, the gold and platinum levels. We're really talking about highly optimized products there. You can enter the program wherever you are as a manufacturer and set your sights on, um, on achieving higher levels. So your product is recertified every two years. And if you're not at those higher levels of certification, you make commitments um, of the things that you're going to work on over that two-year period. So continuous improvement is built in. And, and I think for consumers and specifiers, they know that companies that are engaged in the Cradle to Cradle program are constantly working um, to achieve more and better. What's happened, um, and this is no surprise to you because you're participating in a, in a webinar around material health, is that there's been a lot of trends around the issues of chemicals of concerns. Industry groups, nonprofits, governments, and even big brands are prioritizing the identification and elimination of chemicals of concern. I won't uh, detail all of these for you. I'm sure you're familiar with these things on the stage. But what this led us to over a year ago now was to allow for the first time a manufacturer to just pursue the material health attribute of the full cradle to cradle certification. And we've, we've broken that out because it is one of the most rigorous, well respected uh, material health methodologies on the market. And we knew that there was kind of a need in the marketplace for this. So for the first time you can do that in the reporting format we use for that is the material health certificate, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, in my slides here. But a common question that often gets asked is, you know, how does one determine material health? And there are four critical steps really in this process. And the first is inventory, and that's about knowing what's in it. Um, the, the, and um, uh, the, in this phase, you conduct an inventory of what's in the product. The key questions here are how deep do you go, just the big stuff, you know, things present at you know one percent or do you go deep into the chemical level you know things that are present at a hundred parts per million the second step is screening and once you know what's in it it might be easy to say I hope this doesn't have any really bad stuff in it like lead or BPA or some of these really harmful flame retardants and this is really screening for what's not in it but screening can only get us so far you, you, know, these, you screen against lists that are known bad hazards, and, uh, but you change a molecule, you change the name of a chemical, and now it's not on anybody's list, but we might have the same or worse human and environmental impacts associated with it. So list screening can be a good first step, but it's not a complete step. What we need to do next is look at full assessments, and with full assessments, um, you will learn about the full human and environmental impacts associated with the substances or the materials um, that are in your products. And some of the things to consider in an assessment is, is it just a hazard assessment? Is it a hazard and exposure assess um, assessment? Um, does it consider risk? And then the final stage is optimization. And the goal here is really designing your product to pose no risks. And, and you may need to reformulate, innovate, or go through an assessment process during the design phase, um, alternatives assessment, so that you're choosing the right ingredients from the very beginning. And before I go further here, I want to say that there's a lot of um, uh, happening in the material health space in the built environment, and Terry alluded to that. And I've had the opportunity over the last two years to work with the Healthy Building Network, the Health Product Declaration Collaborative, ILFI and the Clean Production Action to analyze and compare the various programs and protocols. And what we found is that these programs are very complementary and that they work well together. And I want to say, while you may be on a path to choose which product is right for you, know that this is a, a complementary ecosystem. And I'll show you on the next slide here kind of how all of these tools work together. So what we're doing here is working on consistent messaging to the marketplace to simplify the process for manufacturers and to provide meaningful information to specifiers. Our common goal is an abundance of safe and healthy products in the marketplace. So let's take a look at how kind of complementary these things are. First is the declare label. And declare is an inventory of what's in the product. It's a self-declared inventory, um, but that's what you're really looking at. What are the ingredient lists here? 
and then it screens against the Living Building Challenge Red List, which is a relatively small list um, of, um, of known bad hazards. The next um, tool is the Health Product Declaration. And the Health Product Declaration gives us a very detailed uh, um, uh, protocol for how to inventory uh, a product down to 100 parts per million. You don't have to go that deep, but it'll walk you through going that deep in your product. And what I like here is that they paired this inventory tool with the green screen list translator. And the green screen list trans translator is the biggest list we have of known bad hazards. And so that's going to give us the most complete screening. And what I would say to a manufacturer who's new to the material health space, if you've done nothing else, do this, do the, do the HPD and the list um, and the green screen list translator, and that is a great place to start. That will give you a wonderful base of knowledge from which you can build from. Then you can move to the assessment phase, and there's two tools um, that, do, that help you with that. One is the full green screen hazard assessment. The green screen uh, chemical hazard assessment looks at individual chemicals only, um, but it's really helpful with alternative assessments between chemicals. And it can give you an indication of how optimized a product is if you can say that it doesn't have you know, any benchmark ones. Those are the really bad players, like the carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxicants, those sort of really, really bad players. And of course, the cradle to cradle tools, whether it be the material health certificate or the full um, assessment uh, will take you through the full assessment phase and your level of certification will indicate how optimized your product is. And I'll, I'll give you a quick summary of that um, at the end, but our goal here is really to be fully optimized um, at the gold um, and platinum levels. So these tools build on each other. So uh, like I said, a, a, a complement ecosystem to help you through this process of inventory screening assessment and optimization. So now what I'd like to do is go deep into the material health methodology and give you a sense for uh, what's involved here. We are a little shy on time, Terry, so I'm going to um, be a little more speedy than I might have planned, okay? <laughs> Uh, what we're getting at um, here in the material health attribute is designing products that are safe and healthy for humans in the environment from production to use and reuse. So the cradle to cradle assessment considers all three of those uh, life cycle um, parts. And the goal here is safe ingredients again perpetually cycled. So the first step um, is the inventory. And the first step um, uh, is, is creating a bill of materials. And we look first at the homogeneous materials um, in the product. And I'm using this detergent bottle that you see on the screen here as an example. And so the homogeneous materials, the things that can't be broken down any further, are the, the cap, the bottle, of course, those are made of two different kinds of plastic, the label, the, the, the actual liquid that's in the bottle, the inks that are used on the label, the glue that keeps the, the label on the bottle. Um, these are the homogeneous materials that are present at 100 parts per million or higher in, the, um, in this product. Then next, we're going to look at the chemicals within those materials that are present at 100 parts per million or higher. And so this is just to say um, it's a very, very detailed examination of the product. So to get the complete chemical profile, the assessor begins to contact the supply chain to understand the chemical formulations of each materials. I'll also say that if you're a manufacturer who's done um, a very detailed health product declaration, that's a great place for your assessor to start. So that's good work that would contribute towards your cradle-to-cradle -cradle assessment. Um, but the, the, um, the, uh, the assessor engaged in this, and if there was some information that you couldn't get on your own because your suppliers wouldn't give it up, the um, assessor will engage in non-disclosures uh, to, to, to get at that very detailed information. So it can be really challenging to get this information from suppliers and their suppliers, and in some cases there may be proprietary concerns. In many cases, um, a supplier might just not know what they're getting from another supplier. So as I mentioned, assessors enter into these non-disclosure agreements to make sure that they can get detailed and accurate information. And this is where I like to, you know, sort of pause in a moment about transparency. You know, this is such a big, you know, public transparency of chemical ingredients is a big call 
in our industry right now. But know that this is a business reality. These supply chains are so complicated and manufacturers aren't just holding out on making their information public. It's really an industry transformation that goes deep into the supply chain and reaches back to the chemical companies. And the C2C assessor focuses on getting complete information and sometimes to get that complete information it can't be made public because it's under NDA. Don't get me wrong, the lack of supply chain knowledge is one of the biggest issues in getting healthier materials on the marketplace and with the inclusion in LEED and the transparency initiatives and other industry changes I expect that we'll see rapid transformation in the industry. The next step after the assessor has gathered that very detailed bill of materials is they scan against the band list. So Cradle to Cradle has a band list. Um, the the uh, Living Building Challenge red list was modeled off of this list, so they're almost identical. Um, and just know that a product cannot be certified if it contains any of these band list items. And for your um, consumers or specifiers, that's the first thing they can know about a product that's been certified through Cradle to Cradle, that it will not have any of these really bad players in it. That's at the bronze level. So I think that's a really nice uh, first step, something you can know about cradle to cradle. So the after we've done the screening phase for cradle to cradle, we go into these toxicological assessments. And um, these assessments are really what distinguishes cradle to cradle from other tools and claims in the marketplace. They're conducted by chemists and toxicologists, they're scientifically based, and they're incredibly detailed. And the goal of the assessment is to truly understand all human and environmental endpoints um, with the goal of identifying safer alternatives. So um, let me just give you a quick view. Oh, I've got one more slide on this. So how do you conduct a, um, a one of these uh, assessments? The assessor first classifies each chemical hazard against 24 human and environmental endpoints. And they do this by examining all relevant sources, including measuring data from standardized tests, scientific literature, authoritative lists, even modeling and analogs um, to understand the chemistry. But in some cases, there's not enough scientific data to make an assessment, so a data gap is assigned, but only after an exhaustive search has been completed and no hazard classification can be made. If a data gap exists, a product cannot achieve gold in material health, which is just to assure you that gold is very difficult to achieve and is highly regarded um, in the marketplace. I wanted to give you a sense of what are these 24 human and environmental endpoints. Um, these are the human uh, criteria that, that are looked at. These are the environmental criteria uh, that are looked at. And so each one of these criteria for each chemical in the product gets a green, yellow, red, or gray, which means not enough scientific um, information is present. Um, so based on all of that, um, each chemical, as I mentioned, is given one of these ratings, and the aspirational goal here is to ultimately have a product that is only made of green and yellow rated materials and to eliminate all red or excess materials in the product. Another important aspect of the cradle-to-cradle -cradle material health methodology is the exposure assessment. We do this because chemicals aren't just good or bad. Sometimes um, some, something that's safe for humans may be toxic to fish once it goes down the drain, or maybe um, uh, maybe safe uh, for the environment but not uh, for skin contact, for example. An example of this is lead. Lead, uh, when bioavailable by um, inhalation, skin contact, or orally in a product such as children's toys um, or degrading building materials, is poisonous. But when lead is used as a stabilizing alloy in the metal base of the chair you might be sitting on, it can be safely manufactured, used, and recycled. The cradle-to-cradle -cradle exposure assessment is not a traditional risk assessment. There's no attempt here um, to, to quantify the magnitude or the potential exposure. The goal is to assess whether or not plausible avenues of exposure exist during manufacture, use, and highly likely but even unintended use scenarios. Any amount of plausible exposure is sufficient to rate a chemical as posing a risk. Um, so for example, a red or gray hazard rating can become yellow, or a yellow hazard rating can become green um, if uh, it's deemed that there's no plausible exposure. And I know some of those manufacturers who deal with some of these, these tricky things like, you know, silica right, is, is, is what's made of glass, but it comes up, or is, is what glass is made of, but it comes up as a red hazard, um, you know, in your HPD um, kind of thing. The exposure assessment would, would explain that. So 
Let me just take you through this really quickly so you can see how this all comes together. Uh, each chemical in a material is assessed against the 24 human and environmental um, endpoints and results in a chemical hazard assessment. If the chemical is red in any of the 24 endpoints, the hazard assessment for the chemical is classified as red. And then each chemical is assessed for potential exposure throughout the life cycle. The goal here, again, is to assess whether there's any plausible avenues of exposure. Together, the hazard assessment and the exposure assessment in equal the single chemical risk assessment. And so if any aspect of, of this chemical in any of the 24 endpoints was red, this single chemical hazard assessment would be red. So all chemicals in a given material are assessed this way. There may be four, there may be a dozen or more. And all of those single chemical risk assessments are then rolled into a material level. And again, the lowest level of achievement is the end rating. So if any one of those chemicals had an overall assessment of red, the material would be red. And that's just to say, again, this is a very um, uh, conservative approach. So I'm going to speed up here. The summary um, of, of that assessment might look something like this. Um, and then step four is to use that information to, to optimize, identify alternatives, reformulate or redesign, and support better decision making in your design process. Uh, this is a summary of the full program requirements in material health, the percentage assessed, and things like that. But what I want to give you is a quick summary of what you can know about a product uh, that, that, that receives a, a material health rating. If it's bronze, it means it has no cradle-to-cradle -cradle band list chemicals in it. If it's silver, it means that there is no exposure from carcinogens, mutagens, or reproductive toxicants. And if it's gold, it means that it's safe for humans in the environment, that it's fully optimized. The platinum level goes one step beyond that and also considers process chemicals um, during the manufacture. Okay? So now, this all comes together in the material health uh, certificate. So remember, this is just one aspect of full cradle-to-cradle -cradle certification, but you can just pursue this material health aspect and receive this material health certificate. So, and what this is is really a tool for manufacturers to communicate their work towards chemically optimized products. It's an enhanced reporting format over what we had been using in the past. We've just been using these, uh, you know, the overall rating um, or scorecard. And the um, uh, and and what it will give you here is a summary of the achievement level, so silver. But what does that mean? Not always easy to remember. It means that this product has passed the cradle-to-cradle -cradle band list, that a material optimization strategy has been developed, again, reinforcing the continuous improvement process of cradle-to-cradle, -cradle, and that there is no exposure from carcinogens, mutagens, or reproductive toxicants. It also talks about what products are covered here because multiple product lines, colors, SKUs can be covered in a single certificate. Um, when it expires, again, these are good for two years, part of that continuous improvement process and who it was assessed by. A few other important pieces of information we want to include here are what percentage of the materials um, are assessed. This is because there can be data gaps. At the gold level, this would always be 100%, um, but in this case, it's 90, 90 to 100%, which is really good uh, for the silver level. You can get a sense for the assessment rating by weight. And this, the bar graph gives you a sense for the number of materials in this product, 61 homogeneous materials in this product, and what their path is to optimization. So you can see very, very small um, here in what the percentage is of this. There are three where there's um, data gaps, uh, not enough scientific um, information to make a determination. And there are five that have been accessed. Likely, given what I'm looking at here with the percentage in this carpet, is these are probably the dyes. These are probably some of the SKUs and these, these carpets um, uh, that have dyes that are problematic, but there probably are um, dye combinations in this carpet um, that would be certified as gold, uh, but they all fall under one, one certificate. So with that, I'll just make this quick summary, you know, why a cradle-to-cradle -cradle material health certificate. It really is a framework to design with positive chemistry. So it's something that, that, that not only, you know, it's not an end point that you get the certificate, it really is a process that you and your team go through. It clearly communicates progress uh, on material health optimization. It covers all phases of process, including the inventory, screening, assessment, and gives you some indication of optimization based on your achievement level. 
Exposure considerations in the assessment phase provide a balanced perspective of risk during manufacturer use and reuse phases. You have control over ingredient disclosure while a detailed ingredient um, list has been put together by your assessor or in conjunction with you. It's your choice whether you publish that or what of that you do publish. Uh, there is a detailed chemical assessment which provides you information to help you stay ahead of market and regulatory demands. You'll know if you've got a, a, a chemical in there or a, a, a risk or hazard that might you know, ultimately end up on the, the California you know, uh, consumer products uh, list and you can sort of stay ahead of that and be designing that out before it becomes a problem. And finally that this is a rigorous ISO compliant third party program. So with that, Terry, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Stacey. That, that was really fascinating. And um, I want to ask you kind of a, a pointed question, which is, would it be fair to say that the cradle to cradle optimization certification or material health certificate is really a uh, it's a design tool more than it is a, a rating system or a, or a disclosure program. It strikes me that you get, while it is a rating system, you do get a rating, that seems to me that it's the kind of icing on the cake, that really the program itself uh, it is a design tool. You're, you're absolutely right, Terry, and I would say that the, the, the cradle to cradle material health methodology um, is a is a design protocol to design with better chemistry and then the overall cradle to cradle certification that includes all five attributes is really about you know uh, designing regenerative products so yes so getting back to the material health overview now that a manufacturer has done all of that work to make a highly optimized product wouldn't they want to tell the story about what they've done and what they're continuing to do? So the material health overview, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, can be added to a transparency report. Now that material information can be delivered side by side with the environmental performance information. Uh, and it also can be delivered as, as a standalone report. Let me give you a closer view of it. Uh, again, it's a standard template that each program that we've talked about can use. It's laid out the same way. It starts out with a description of the program itself with links to the uh, program site, a brief description of how it works, and then a summary of the assessment scope and results. So you can see clearly the level, the rating it achieved. Uh, there's a mouse over that tells you what that means. Um, all of the attributes from the certificate are displayed here. Uh, all of these uh, rating system uh, results uh, have a, a mouse rollover, so it explains what they mean. Uh, but here's really now the opportunity to leverage this investment in the cradle to cradle certification, which is to talk about how did that rating get achieved. So the text that you're seeing is part of the template that we deliver to manufacturers. Uh, to encourage them, here's some of the topics that you might want to write about. How the rating is achieved, certification level, what's in the product and why. Assessed scenarios are all standard headers. And these are the content topics that we suggest the manufacturer write to. What does it mean to have achieved this level? How did you do it? Well, what's in the product and why? The discussion of the material choices. The scenarios that were assessed. And then, you know, really importantly, being able to show off the optimization strategy. What is the manufacturer doing or is going to be exploring to continue to improve you know, the material health of its products? So now when this report is part of a transparency report, more detail about these strategies and these activities can be included in the optional page three or if it's a standalone report, uh, the section can get used to tell that story right, right here on the page. You see this standalone report 
is illustrating uh, using Declare uh, to tell their material health story. We also have the opportunity for manufacturers to add an optional uh, multi-attribute zone to include any of the other uh, content topics that they share to uh, help their customers earn other lead credits. And all of these transparency reports or material health overviews uh, get delivered uh, to the market through a manufacturer's brand showroom and it's in the cloud. Everything's all in one place. It's freely available to any user. Um, more of the manufacturer's uh, disclosures and, and other content they've created can also be linked to there. Uh, but the idea now is that there's, there's multiple points of entry, no matter how the manufacturer decides to uh, provide that data to the public, whether it's from their own website, whether it's uh, someone coming to the showroom and linking to the product, whether it's through other, um, either BIM or other kinds of uh, information sharing sites. And just real quickly, for those who want to hang on just another moment, I'll give you a demo. Um, this is uh, Toto's uh, live showroom. You can see all of the products that they are currently providing transparency information for. I'll show you, this is the uh, standalone uh, material health overview. It was kind of interesting. This is a great example of how a program, a disclosure program like Declare, uh, identified to Toto that PVC was really a, a red list material, kind of low-hanging fruit, and they were able to go back and very quickly design a product that was PVC-free and create this freestanding material health overview where they very proudly can talk about how they achieved this rating level, what's in the product and why, how they're discontinuing red list materials, and what efforts they're putting in place uh, to continue to improve the material health of the this product. I can click on any of these links to actually go to the Declare labels. I can click to the standard. This is all true in the Cradle to Cradle program as well. You'll be able to click directly on the certificate. You'll be able to click on the standard. You can see the value that it earns in the rating systems. So any more information that you would want in addition to what is provided here in the report is available to you depending upon you know how, how deep a dive you want to take. And here's an example of a transparency report, which by the way, they all do have downloadable PDFs because people still do like PDFs and they serve a purpose. So you get both, it's in the cloud and a PDF. Um, but now I can go to page two. Maybe you can say we cheated a little bit, maybe it's four pages, not really three. But now the user can toggle between material health results and life cycle assessment results. And the pages are laid out in the identical way. The technical scope and results are on the left. And the interpretation, what does it mean, what's causing the greatest impacts, are on the right. You've made the LCA results themselves understandable by showing what life cycle stages were included in the LCA, which information modules. We use our single figure score uh, to show which life cycle stages the greatest impacts are happening in with a quick caption that describes the greatest contributors. And we do still provide all the full Tracy impact characterized results as required uh, in a uh, type three environmental declaration. We've developed a color coding system to quickly show uh, that this is a multi-product report, and so we're demonstrating a multi-product weighted average so you can see, if you care to, where the greatest impacts are occurring and where there's variation. Here we've tried to provide some more explanation about what these characterizations are for each impact category. You can click on and read the PCR and all of the use cases uh, that drive that PCR. Again, the rating system values clicking to the rating system themselves, and then very simply seeing what the level of verification and certification uh, for each type of report. And as we noted, uh, the declare label is a, is a self-declared 
uh, program. So wrapping up, who are Sustainable Minds Transparency products for? Uh, you know, fundamentally, we just kind of lay it out there. If you're a manufacturer who believes that better marketing helps sales, that's kind of the top line premise. You, you have to believe that if you're going to invest in creating better marketing tools. And then secondarily, if your company's positioning is that you are an industry or market leader, you care about innovation and design, both your product and your brand, you're thinking holistically and longer term, you are actually making improvements to your products, both in environmental performance and material health, and that you care about providing the information to make those claims and those stories understandable and meaningful. Uh, and so, you know, the bottom line to the material health overview is that we have created a standardized way for manufacturers to tell their product sustainability stories in one integrated report uh, designed for non-technical readers to get as much or as little information as they like to be able to credibly deliver uh, you know, real information to build a credibly greater brand. Stacey, I want to thank you for being with us today. And uh, I've learned a lot from uh, working with you to put this webcast together. Um, we actually answered all the questions that came in through the presentations that we both gave. So I'd like to thank everyone who attended today's webcast and stayed with us a few minutes uh, on the back end. Stacy, again, thank you so much for being here today and, and uh, hoping that the folks uh, who came also learned a lot and will give serious consideration to creating Cradle to Cradle certified products. Thanks, Terry. I really appreciate the opportunity. And uh, everyone, have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.